Hey everyone, today on People Now, thousands evacuated after two dams burst in Michigan. We have details. Plus, in a People exclusive, music mogul Russell Simmons' sexual assault accusers speak out. And this week's People cover story, how the Queen's faith is helping her keep calm and carry on during these difficult times. People is bringing you the bombshell in concert streaming event with the cast of Smash. We have all you need to know. Also today, anything that, that brings people joy right now feels like it. David Diggs gets real with us about Hamilton Live and his new show, Snowpiercer. And the super motivational Dante Colley is here talking about how he comes up with his incredibly inspiring viral videos. All that and more today on People Now. Let's go. Hey everyone, welcome to People Now. Happy Wednesday. I'm Jeremy Parsons here in New York. It's nice. We're midway through the week. I'm feeling good. Andrea, how are you? I'm great. Yeah, it's nice out here too. Feeling good in Wisconsin. By the Hope way, I, I know Wednesday. you've been busy with making making some wild videos on the gram. <laughs> oh yeah. We did put this video up. The Three Witches of Random Lake. That's where I live. Random Lake, it's a real town. Uh, yeah, it took us maybe two months to do. It was a lot of jumping, some editing by my sister, but it was fun. A lot of editing. That, that took some time. That was very impressive. You guys should check it out on Andrea, Andrea's um, Instagram. But there's a lot to get to today. We actually begin on a serious note. Here's what you need to know and what's trending for today. Thousands of people in central Michigan are under evacuation orders due to life-threatening flooding after two dams breached Tuesday night following days of heavy rain. According to CBS News, the National Weather Service issued a flash flood warning for areas close to the Titabawassee River after the dams experienced catastrophic failures. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer declared a state of emergency Tuesday night. She urged nearly 42,000 people to evacuate while maintaining social distancing guidelines amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Governor Whitmer encouraged residents to either go to a family member's home who lives in a different part of the state or go to one of the shelters that are open. She warned that downtown Midland could be under approximately nine feet of water. Wow, shocking to hear that. And according to the New York Times, this was the second time in 24 hours that residents were urged to evacuate. The National Weather Service first ordered evacuations after four to seven inches of rain flooded that area on Sunday and Monday. CNN reported on Wednesday morning the Titabawassee River surged past its record midland mark of 33.39 feet and is continuing to rise. It is projected to crest around 38 feet by 8 p.m. Governor Whitmer acknowledged that to go through this in the midst of a global pandemic is almost unthinkable. She added, quote, but we are here and to the best of our ability, we are going to navigate this together. Matt Lauer is claiming he was falsely accused of rape. It's in a new op-ed published Tuesday for Mediaite. He's also slamming Ronan Farrow's reporting in the best-selling book, Cash and Kill, Lies, Spies, and a Conspiracy to Protect Predators. Now, in that op-ed, Lauer acknowledges having an inappropriate relationship with a fellow employee in the workplace, but insists that it was entirely consensual. He denies former NBC News employee Brooke Neville's allegation that the two had non-consensual sex. He claims that Farrow did not fact-check some of the allegations in an effort to sell books. Lauer points to the fact that Neville's didn't use the words rape or assault while filing her complaint with NBC in November. November of 2017. He writes that he was disappointed, but not surprised that Pharaoh's overall reporting faced so little scrutiny until a New York Times piece was published on May 17th, which criticizes Pharaoh's reporting and fact checking. Lau reveals it was that piece that prompted him to move forward with his own findings. Farrow reacted to these claims on Twitter, writing that Lauer is just wrong. He also responded to the Times article, tweeting, I stand by my reporting. Lauer says that he tracked down three people who should have been witnesses for Neville's account. He claims to have contacted the man that she was dating at the time, whom she says she cried to about an alleged incident. Lauer says Farrow never reached out to this man. After speaking to him on the phone for two hours, Lauer claims that he was upset about being referenced in the book, but feared criticism if he spoke out. Lauer says the man also has no recollection of her crying to him at the specified time of that event. Lauer writes in the op-ed, I ask people to consider how they would react if someone they loved were accused of something horrific and basic journalistic standards were ignored because of a desire to sell books. Meanwhile, Neville spoke out on Twitter writing, Darvo, deny, attack, reverse victim, and offender. The new HBO Max documentary, On the Record, showcases the stories of women who claim music mogul Russell Simmons sexually assaulted them. Three of the women are opening up about the allegations exclusively in this week's issue of People. Drew Dixon was a young executive at Simmons' label, Def Jam, in the mid-1990s. She tells people that she endured relentless harassment from the music mogul. She explains, quote, it started out verbal, then it escalated. 
Drew claims that in 1995, Simmons sexually assaulted her at his apartment. She says that after it happened, she told a few friends, but didn't go to the police because she didn't want the alleged assault to be her legacy. However, she tells us now she is free of having to accommodate this secret and adds, my vitality is back. Former member of hip hop group Mercedes Ladies, Sherry Cher says Simmons played an integral part at one point in her life. She says Simmons was showing her around his new office as her friend interviewed rapper Curtis Blow. And she says that he suggested that she sit on the couch. The next thing she knew, he was on her. She says that she was in total shock. She explains that she considered calling the police at the time, but feared that no one would believe her due to Simmons' godlike reputation in the Bronx. Cher came out with her story in 2017. She says that coming forward was healing, and she adds, quote, Russell victimized me, but I'm a victor. Former model Silai Abrams and Simmons had a physical relationship in the early 90s. She tells people that when the assault occurred, their physical relationship had ended. She explains that the two met up again in 1994 at a party where she was drinking. She recalls that she asked him to drive her to her friend's house, but he drove her back to his place. Abrams says she tried to fight Simmons off, and she adds, quote, it didn't work. I was too drunk. I weighed 112 pounds. The following morning, Abrams called Simmons and he allegedly downplayed the encounter. That day, Abrams attempted suicide by swallowing pills. She says she remembers thinking, I had $30 to my name, he had 30 million. I didn't have a chance in hell to go up against him. I got sober, left the industry, and spent a lot of time in recovery groups. You can see more from On the Record when it premieres May 27th on HBO Max. And if you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, please contact the National Sexual Assault Hotline at the number below, or you can go to online.rain.org. Amid a dramatic divorce battle between Mary-Kate Olsen and her husband, Olivier Sarkozy, sources reveal in this week's issue of People that the two led very different lifestyles, and that is what drove them apart. One insider says that, quote, their relationship was messy for a really long time, and as that Olsen is super career-focused, and that Sarkozy wanted her to be more available. Another source reveals that Sarkozy never understood her drive and passion, and would have loved to have a stay-at-home wife. Another source says that while Sarkozy, who already has two children with his ex-wife of 14 years, didn't want to have any more children, Olsen did. Olsen, who's been married to the French banker since 2015, requested an emergency order to file for divorce on May 13th, but was denied. She initially petitioned for divorce on April 17th, but due to the coronavirus crisis, New York City courts haven't been accepting divorce filings, except in cases of emergency. According to a copy of the affidavit, Olsen states that she is, quote, petrified that my husband is trying to deprive me of the home that we have lived in. And if he is successful, I will not only lose my home, but I risk losing my personal property as well. Olsen and Sarkozy were first spotted getting close at a New York Knicks game in 2012. The couple married in a small New York City ceremony after three years of dating. A Sarkozy family source reveals that the Sarkozy family wasn't thrilled over the marriage because they didn't see a natural fit. In the end, they just grew more apart. That's the quote. For this week's People Cover Story, we are taking a look at the remarkable 68-year record-breaking reign of Queen Elizabeth. The monarch is keeping calm and carrying on at 94 years old and is staying especially strong during these tough times. She recently spoke to the public amid the coronavirus pandemic on May 8th on what was the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II in Europe. She said, quote, never give up, never despair. It was a poignant moment from the queen who speaks so rarely. In early April, the queen addressed the pandemic and her biographer, Robert Lacey, author of the books Monarch and Majesty, tells us that her remarks were, quote, sober and realistic, but there was a grounded optimism to it. A high level royal source says that the queen always hits the right mark and that she has impeccable judgment. Yeah, throughout her reign, the queen has seen her share of tough times. When she turned 18 years old, the then princess joined the auxiliary territorial service and trained as a truck mechanic and driver. Also during her wedding to Prince Philip in 1947, she stood in solidarity with post-war Britons undergoing clothing rationing. She used coupons to help buy her wedding gown. Then in 1981, the queen stayed calm, cool, and collected when a troubled teen fired blanks at her and her horse that was during the Trooping the Color Parade. And after the death of Princess Diana in 1997, the queen, who was criticized as cold, ultimately addressed the world as, quote, your queen and as a grandmother. So what is the secret that helps Queen Elizabeth get through the tough times? Those who know her best say it's her deep faith. As head of the Church of England, Queen Elizabeth is profoundly religious. A close insider tells us that during these uncertain times, the queen is missing her faith-filled routine and says, quote, her Christian faith means so much to her and those rituals of going to church on Sunday and praying in chapel are not happening. 
That's a massive impact for her, not being able to go with people and pray. But Lacey tells us that while the queen feels the poignancy of the current situation, it, quote, does not turn into depression or defeat. She sees it in the bigger context of her religious faith and of a God who holds her and her family in his hands. It is the solid and simple faith that sustains the queen. In this week's issue of People, we're spotlighting the incredible high school seniors across the country in the class of 2020. They may not get to have the traditional graduation ceremony they expected, but one thing is for sure, they will be going out into the world and making a difference. And actually, they are already making a difference. Take Kylie McCumber, who started Kylie's Care Kits for Kids when she was just 10 years old. She was inspired by her own experience with childhood hunger to help kids in her area who don't have enough to eat at home. The kits include six meals, plus some snacks and drinks to help supplement children's diets on weekends when they don't have access to meals at school. In her first week, Kylie gave out kits to eight kids. Eight years later, the nonprofit provides food for 596 children every week throughout Massachusetts. Very inspiring. We also caught up with some of the other amazing students in this week's issue and got their thoughts about what graduation means to them. So take a look and remember, you can pick up a copy of People to learn more about their stories. Dear class of 2020. Class of 2020, we all have our stories. Your story matters, his story matters, her story matters. I was chosen to be valedictorian and I will be the first in my family to graduate from college. When I came out as gay during an old school assembly, it felt like one weight was lifted off my shoulders only to be replaced by another. And all I wanted was to feel heard and validated in a way that I never was and never experienced before. I'm actually the first person in my family to even go to high school. So for me, graduation was never just another cap and gown ceremony. It was a culmination, not just of my hard work and growth, but also my parents' lifelong sacrifice and hope that their children would have the resources they never did. People with disabilities often have lower expectations placed on them and are segregated. Go into your adult life knowing that people with disabilities are people first. I want to spend the rest of my life helping those who have experienced rejection for being who they are. No matter the situation, we have succeeded in being here, in getting here. And today, all I want to say is hold hands with your loved ones and celebrate who we are. 2020. Life can take away our opportunities, but it can never take away all the hard work we put in to get where we are today. You are the reason for your success. And as long as you believe in yourself, nothing can stop you from reaching your goals. We continue to be resilient. We are hopeful and we will not only endure, but we will thrive. So to all my fellow seniors, as you go out into the world, be kind to everyone. Explore your interests and pursue your dreams with passion and dedication. I hope I have inspired people to work hard and dream big. Congratulations to all my fellow graduates. We made it. All right, stay with us. Kamel Nanjani is telling us all about his new comedy romance with Issa Rae, The Lovebirds, and what he loved most about the reaction to his ripped body while filming Marvel's upcoming movie, The Eternals. Plus, Hamilton's David Diggs stars in the new series, Snowpiercer. He'll be here to talk about both of those things and more. Today's story to make you smile was dubbed the hope we need on Instagram by the New York Times. Dante Colley has been sharing his love of dance on social media to bring others joy. His dance videos include empowering life affirmations and he's uplifting people all around the world, which we really need right now more than ever. I caught up with Dante and he told me how and why he does it. In order for me to put out, I need to be feeling good within, you know? So I really try and take time, be patient, and just go with the flow because we're not always gonna have everything figured out. We're not always gonna know what's next or what ne is next to come. Um, besides the fact that we're all human beings at the end of the day and we all need a little bit of encouragement and so do I. And we really need to like use this time to acknowledge the fact that we can all really hold hands together and really push through this. So it's yeah. been interesting. Is there a story from early on of a person that you helped that kind of sticks in your mind today? I mean, there's, I've gotten plenty of like, plenty of different responses. I mean, like in my personal DMs, just thanking me and appreciating me and letting me know that I've gotten them through to possibly a next step or like a next elevation of what they may be going through. And to me, that's exactly why I do it. And that means the world to me. So, I mean, it's just insane to see how 
connected, we can all be on the internet at one time. So it's important to just keep keep going and keep pushing and keep bringing us all together, you know? Dancing comes naturally to Dante. He's entirely self-taught, and he told me how he comes up with his dance routines and those inspirational messages that his followers love so much. I think that's why I love doing them so much because they're all spontaneous. Like they all, I never know what the, the story is that I'm gonna tell until I get to my computer to start editing. So literally the music is the first part and I'll just like record on my iPhone and go for it and just improv. Um, and then airdrop it to my computer, edit it, and see what happens next. Dante's dance skills have not only made him an internet sensation, but also a music video star. He even helped inspire Ariana Grande's music video for her song Monopoly, and he was featured in it. I think the, the most beautiful moment was how much love everybody had for each other. It was so family-oriented and so so much about just having a good time together and making something fun together that didn't need to be super serious, but could really shine light on just getting rid of bad vibes and just embracing each moment. And I really am so grateful for Victoria Monet and Ariana and just the whole team um, for letting me be a part of something so special. You're also in Doja Cat Say So music video. You're everywhere. I mean, that video is really, really fun. What stands out to you most about that day? Oh my gosh. Doja Cat is somebody that I love so much. I have been watching her journey um, and I've been rooting for her since the beginning. Um, that set was so much fun. Um, Hannah Lex Davis is such an amazing, talented director and such a boss. So just to just to see the the product unfold while I was watching it on when it premiered was just something that like I am still in awe about um, because I love the song. The song was something that I was listening to every single day until this day. So it's just really interesting to see how the world works. Dante's videos have also inspired big names like Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith, even Beyonce, Jennifer Garner, she got in on the fun too, making her own version of Dante's videos, which got me thinking, if Dante could do a dance collab with any celeb of his choice, who would it be? I would say Beyonce and Rihanna are two people that I would love to collaborate with one day in the future. Um, they're just super powerful people who have really paved the way for so many people, like any kind of person that you identify as. Um, so I think being a part of something with them would be super special and can't wait for the day. It will be one day, but we'll see when it comes. With everyone feeling the effects of today's climate, what better person to ask about how to stay positive through this dark time than Dante himself? Here's his advice for getting through social distancing and self-isolation. I would say take your time. I think, you know, there. There's been a lot of things going around or being passed around online where productivity is something that you need to maximize on while you're in lockdown. And I think getting up and getting your day going is just as productive as like doing something. Like there's productivity that lies in different ways where it doesn't have to be in the form of a product. It can be the form of just you taking on your day for yourself. Like maybe doing a few stretches, maybe going out for a quick walk by yourself, like that is productive. And there, I did see some content online basically saying like, you're lacking discipline if you're not being productive in this time. And that's totally not the case. We all run at different times and run on different time zones. Like even for me, I will go to bed at like five o'clock in the morning. Oh my goodness, what are you doing like till three. five? I don't know. It's just my time schedule is just totally rocked. And that's totally and that's fine, fine right now. <laughs> exactly. And it's totally cool. Like we're all just running on different different gears and different shifts, but just take your time. Like we're gonna be good. It's gonna be fine. And just make sure you're prioritizing your specific needs because that's what's most important. For more of Dante Colley's motivational messages and dance videos, follow him on Instagram and on TikTok at Dante Colley. Married at First Sight stars Jamie Otis and Doug Hayner welcome their new baby boy, Hendrix Douglas, on May 13th. The couple's opening up exclusively to people about how the at-home birth was life-changing for the two of them. 
it was intense. I mean, it was out of control. So the contractions came and they were like, like fire, like all consuming of my whole entire body. But I literally just, I like tried to breathe. It's very, <laughs> it's very easy to tell some, a woman who's in a lot of pain to breathe. Um, but I did, I tried really hard and I tried not to panic. And I tried to remind myself that my baby boy is going through the same exact thing that I am. And so I would look at his ultrasound picture and I would just envision that like the, all the pain that I'm in, he's probably experiencing as well. And he doesn't ever get a choice for, you know, pain medication. Mm -hmm. So we're doing this together. And every contraction, I just envisioned him coming down and we're both in the same amount of pain. We're both mm -hmm. pushing and working hard to get him out safely and soundly. And I'm probably going to cry. Um, just because it was, it was a really, really great moment. I could feel him kicking me as, you know, like as in between contractions, I could feel him kind of wiggling around in there. Mm -hmm. And it was, it just, it really does make you feel one with your baby. Otis reveals that she immediately had an extremely strong bond with Hendrix that she didn't initially experience with her daughter, Henley Grace. Speaking of Henley Grace, it turns out she wasn't too sure about her new role as big sister at first but she did have an adorable reaction to meeting her baby brother for the first time just a few short hours after his birth. I don't know if she completely got it, but she does, she's starting to now, like she knows it's his brother, that, that's yeah. her brother, and she tried to hold him and then got a little weary and scared and then yeah. was really excited to like see his fingers and toes yeah. and count his, count his toes. This and, was the best part. Yeah. So the minute she saw him, she goes, oh, wow, like a baby. And I was like, yeah, the baby and mommy's belly came out. And she goes, oh, wow. And then she just starts counting his toes. Yeah. Like one, two, three, <laughs> like making sure all 10 toes are there. The couple has been very open about their struggles to conceive. They lost their first son, Jonathan, when Otis was four months pregnant. And after Henley was born, she suffered two miscarriages, which made Hendrix's birth all the more special. There's no words for it because I remember, you know, way back when we first tried starting after Gracie to have our second child and, you know, I, I didn't think that we were going to have any issues because, you know, we lost our first baby in the second trimester and so I was like, almost thinking like God wouldn't do that to us again. Like, I don't know. That's just, maybe that sounds silly. I don't know. And then, but I was like, oh, this is of course going to be smooth. Like, I can't imagine anything's going to happen. And then, of course, we had those two losses back to back in the very beginning of trying to conceive. And I was like, are we going to even be able to have a baby? Like what? I, I was did not think that I was going to have this type of an issue. And then, you know, after 18 months of trying to conceive, we were like, all right, it's time to, yeah. it's honestly time to go to a fertility specialist mm -hmm. because clearly we're having issues. And mm -hmm. then <laughs> when we went there and found out we were indeed pregnant with this little guy, <laughs> he was only four weeks along yeah. at that point. It's, it is magical to, to see him. And I'm like, honestly, not a moment goes by that I don't think about the other women who don't get that type of experience, you know, to be able to, I just can't imagine. Like, I remember just wondering, are we ever going to be able to have another baby? Will I ever be able to be pregnant again? And and every time that I had pain, I would just remind, like during the pregnancy, because of course that can be very uncomfortable, but I would truly just remind myself like how blessed I am to have this type of pain. And same thing for labor and delivery with him. It's like, I just, I'm so thankful that I get to have this and I, my heart goes out to the women who are still trying or aren't able to for whatever reason. Like it honestly just, it just breaks my heart. It really does. Married at First Sight Couples Cam premieres Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern on Lifetime. Let's make a decision here, all right? My husband and I have plans tonight. I'll go with not the grease. I'll go with the door. Jabron! The door it is. Tell them what they've won. No, 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 The Lovebirds is a new romantic comedy in which a couple on the verge of a breakup get embroiled in a murder mystery. It stars Kumail and Johnny and Issa Rae. Yeah, and in this week's issue of People, Kumail is opening up about life as a movie star, including why both he and his parents are surprised that he ended up doing what he does. He explains that he was very shy growing up and that he didn't even take part in theater or creative writing in school. But he admits that he watched more movies than anyone else he knows. And his next movie, The Lovebirds, is out on Netflix this Friday. While he only met his co-star Issa Rae briefly once before they started working together, he says he was always a fan of her work. He also told us what his reaction was when he found out he might star opposite her. Watch. I'd been attached to Lovebirds for a little while, 
but nothing much was happening. And then I got an email and they were like, Issa read it and she's into it. What do you think of her? And I was like, oh my God, are you kidding? Dream come true. Let's do it. So I didn't meet Issa until she was signed on to the movie. And I think we immediately hit it off. I feel like there was no like moment of awkwardness or hesitation or anything. I think we got really close really, really quickly uh, working on the script, working on our characters um, and just became like, I think, really, really tight. And I feel like over the course of the entire movie, we really were a unit. We really were together. I gotta say, they look good together. The Lovebirds was set to release in theaters back in April, but it got pushed back because of the pandemic. Then Netflix picked up the rights to release it on their streaming platform instead. Kumail is thrilled by that decision, saying he and Issa just want people to see it. Another of Camille's projects to be delayed, Marvel's Eternals. But lucky for pretty much all of us, it wasn't delayed until after Camille got totally in shape for the role. So you might remember this picture he posted to Instagram back in December. Fans were amazed at how ripped he got. Now he tells us he's continuing to do his Marvel workout to stay in shape during isolation. He admits working out is the only thing tethering him to sanity during this crazy time. And he revealed to us his favorite thing about people's reaction to his new physique. I love it when people are very happy for me. It's better when they're a little upset. What it sort of shows is, you know, that you, it's, it's possible to do it. It's a lot of work. And I said this in my first Instagram post, you know, I was set up in a way nobody's going to be set up where I had a year. I had the best trainers in the world. This was sort of like, I could really focus on this as my job, you know? So I was really like in a, in a position that most people won't get to be, unfortunately. But, and I think that people are annoyed that I'm keeping up with it too. Well, they're like, they're like, you're not gonna be funny anymore. I'm like, yeah, but <laughs> I'm probably a little bit happier. He adds that working out helps him with anxiety and his self-confidence. But how did he suddenly get so ripped? A lot of hard work, obviously, but it turns out he had some help. He asked his Men in Black international co-star Chris Hemsworth for some tips. Kumail told us why he reached out to Chris in particular. He just works really hard, you know? I think, I mean, he's just one of those guys, first of all, I think he's genetically gifted. I mean, look at that family. Look at the, look at all of them, you know? They're like genetically gifted. And I think Chris just really enjoys working out. That's what I learned watching him. Cause you know, if you look at all the Marvel guys, right? Some of them sort of let it go between movies. They look different. And then Chris keeps it, right? So what I learned from him was, okay, you got to make it part of your life. Cause I know how hard it was to achieve like the, the fitness level that I got to. And I was like, if I let it go, I cannot go down this path again. It was just so much work and watching Chris work out. I was like, okay, so I have to find a way to enjoy it. So that was the biggest lesson I learned from him. Yeah, Chris is the right guy. But aside from working out, he's also doing a podcast with his wife, Emily V. Gordon, called Staying In with Emily and Kumail. All profits from the podcast go to people affected by the coronavirus. And Kumail told us how that podcast has actually helped his relationship with his wife. Take a look. Even though we're married and I, we have a really good relationship, you don't get like, all right, now for an hour and a half, let's really talk about how we're feeling, right? You get distracted. It's like, you're like, oh my God, that TV show, let's go watch that. We don't really have like that structured time to really, really check in with each other without any distractions, where all you have to do is listen, respond, and really have a conversation. It's so easy to like kind of not do that. So that's been really, really, it's been really good for our relationship. And I'm really finding out stuff about her that I didn't know before. That was a sneak peek of Smash stars Megan Hilty and Katherine McPhee taking the stage to sing Let Me Be Your Star at the sold out live performance of Bombshell in concert back in 2015. Now, five years after the cast performed that sold out show on Broadway, fans who weren't in the audience will get to enjoy it for the first time. In this week's issue of People, Deborah Messing, who also starred in the series, says she hopes reuniting with the co-stars for the virtual one night only streaming event 
will raise a ton of money to help those suffering as a result of COVID-19. And she hopes that it's gonna lift people's spirits in the process. It definitely will. She remembers that there were thousands of people who could not get tickets to the Broadway performance. So luckily, fans will now get their chance to take it all in. Deborah says their Smash producers reached out to them and said, let's air it, include live interviews from the cast via Zoom, and raise money for COVID relief. How could you say no to that, right? Here's how it'll all go down. The performance will be introduced by Renee Zellweger, and during intermission, there'll be a live reunion with the show's original cast, including Will Chase, Jack Davenport, Megan Hilty, Jeremy Jordan, Catherine McPhee, Leslie Odom Jr., Krista Rodriguez, and many more. The concert and reunion will stream Wednesday night beginning at 8 p.m. Eastern exclusively on People.com, People TV, and People's Facebook and Twitter. Funds will benefit the Actors Fund, which has been helping artists in need amid the coronavirus crisis. To donate, visit ActorsFund.org and be sure to follow along with the hashtag Bombshell in Concert. All right, now moving on to this. Watch. What do you say? This train. 3,000 odd souls surviving on a planet determined to freeze all life in place. And it is not thanks to chance or fate. It is because of order. All this you can't even share. TNT's latest post-apocalyptic sci-fi thriller, Snowpiercer, centers on the last remaining humans who inhabit a moving train circling the globe. There's a divide in class, social injustice, and politics of survival that play throughout the series. David Diggs stars as Andre Layton, a homicide detective in the thriller based on the graphic novel by the same name. It was also made into a critically acclaimed film by Oscar-winning South Korean director Bong Joon-ho, who executive produced on the series. David shares what it was like to work alongside him. He was on set a couple of times. We got to meet and he sort of walked through and, and gave his seal of approval on everything that was happening but such a such a nice guy and and just like seems just genuinely interested in the process and not not trying to like invade it at all or anything just he was he seemed really happy to be there and, and interested in walking around just seeing how you know every everything Every piece of art is a problem to be solved, right? Basically, like, you're trying to tell this story and it's kind of a math equation. Like, what are the different variables you need to wrangle in order to tell this story? And so he seems, like, just thrilled to see how somebody else was, was dealing with that. David has starred in a number of television roles. His first major role was on ABC's hit sitcom, Blackish. He reveals that he's learned a lot about the process of making television and shares what his favorite thing about it is. There's this conversation between actor and writer's room that happens over, often over great distances and certainly over spans of time where we'll, you know, the first thing is the script. I get that, all of us get that, we interpret it. I might make a choice that no one had intended for me to make, but for some reason it works. And now that's canon. Now that's something that Leighton does. I might not have even been aware that I did it, but now the writers are like, oh, I like that. I'm gonna write that into every scene. I noticed this, the first real TV I ever did was Blackish, and I got the script. I showed up on set my first day, I had no idea what I was doing, but I, I had this idea in the first scene that we were shooting that it would be really funny if, if Johan, my character, stepped on Dre's couch. Like, so I'd, I'd like just walked over the back of the couch and so he's like such a hippie and I'd like sit, sat cross-legged on his couch and I knew that that would make Anthony Anderson's character furious, but that's kind of like their vibe anyway. And then they started writing that into every episode. Like, one was there, it's like, make sure you walk over the, the couch. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, so there's this conversation that's happening and then they get new ideas inspired by your ideas and write those. And then you see the script and you're like, ah, I never thought of that, but that's cool that he would do that. So that, that's, that's my favorite part about it. David is best known for his Tony and Grammy award-winning dual roles of Thomas Jefferson and Marquise de Lafayette in the Broadway sensation Hamilton. It was announced that the live recording of Hamilton will be coming to Disney Plus on July 3rd. Very excited for that. David reveals that it was a surprise to him as well. So is he ready for a wave of new Hamilton fandom to hit? Watch. It never really died down. So, you know, I think it. I think it's just a, a continuation, um, which is nice. I mean, I, I hope, you know, anything that, that brings people joy right now feels like a good thing and, and people seem genuinely excited about it. So that's great. For more DB Diggs, watch Snowpiercer, Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern on TNT.
All right, coming up tomorrow, the Extreme Mini Golf Series. Holy moly, is swinging into its second season. Commentators Rob Riggle and Joe Tessitore are telling us more. Plus, Catherine Reitman, creator, showrunner, and star of Netflix's Working Moms, joins us to talk about her show, motherhood, and so much more. So funny, so great. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye, guys.